Good morning and welcome everyone here in the church building and those of you that are worshipping at home or you're watching this as you are away. Easter blessings to you all. This is the most important day on the church calendar. It is this day that affirms our faith, that strengthens our knowledge that Jesus Christ died and is risen and lives today. The light which the world tried to extinguish cannot be put out. Today, we light the candles. Well, we're not because I found out that it's a workplace health and safety issue. So you'll just have to use your imagination. Proclaiming the transforming power of God. As light returns, we give thanks that God's transforming love has been, is now, and will ever be at work within us. Today we celebrate new life, new joy, new possibilities. Christ is alive and living among us. As we look at candles when they are alight, we acknowledge that there is still pain and suffering in the world, but we place our trust in God and in the way shown by Jesus Christ. In the midst of darkness, there is light. In the pain of death, there is life. In the face of what appears to us to be overwhelming odds, God is at work in us and in the world, working for justice and peace, compassion and love and abundant life. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen in us. For wherever we gather in his name, he is there. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Now today I had prepared this service with lots of music so that we would be able to sing. I kept it all in, in the desperate prayer that the government might change its uh, regulations by this morning, but they haven't. So unfortunately, we are not able to sing today. Those of you at home can sing as loudly as you wish. But I hope that the words of the music might encourage you. You might be able to meditate on those, maybe even hum along quietly to yourself. Because the first of these tunes today is Christ the Lord is Risen Today.
Before we go on, Dudley's advised me that someone whose car registration begins CPO has left their car lights on. You might like to just go and turn that off, CPO. Our call to worship continues. Very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, Mary Magdalene, the mother of James, and Salome went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone had already been rolled away. Can you hear the alleluias? Can you hear the mountains shout? Can you hear the stones, the parts in orange are for all of us to say? Can you hear the stones roll away? Can you hear the angels laugh? Can you hear the sun rise? Can you hear the silence break? Hallelujah! Nothing can keep us quiet any longer, for Christ is risen. Alleluia, alleluia, hallelujah. And the next song is This Is The Day. Now we may not be able to sing, but you certainly can clap. So if you would like to clap along to this song, by all means do. first witnesses of the risen Christ, we come to the empty tomb with mixed reactions. We hear the good news that Jesus has risen, yet it is not easy to find this in our lives. Forgive us when we fail to share the risen Christ in our words and actions. We come to the empty tomb seeking forgiveness for all our faults. Help us to put the risen Christ first in our lives. Forgive us when we forget that the tomb is always empty because Jesus is with us wherever we live and worship. Help us to value your gift of Christ on the cross, the gift of a new start, forgiven and graced by love. Help us to celebrate always that Christ is risen Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. I therefore declare to us all, our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And the next song is Alleluia, Alleluia, Give Thanks to the Risen Lord. Amen. 
Good morning. Good to see you on this Easter day. May the Lord bring his joy and peace to your heart and mind on this great day. The epistle this morning is from Romans chapter 6. Don't you know that all of us who were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him, for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. The Gospel reading this morning is from Mark chapter 16. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint the body of Jesus. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. And they asked each other, who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You were looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go and tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's a brand new day. The darkness of last Friday has given away to the bright light of Sunday. On Friday, they watched him die. On the Sabbath, they mourned his death. But now the darkness gives way to light and to tears and to laughter. Today is Sunday, and today Jesus is risen from the dead. If you had asked any number of people there in the darkness of Friday, who is this man, Jesus? The answers would have been completely different to the answers heard on this first Easter Sunday morning. 
On Friday, some would have described Jesus as a heretic, a deluded man. Some would say that he was innocent, but they would all agree he was dead, dead and buried. They watched him die and they saw him taken down from the cross and they looked on as he was laid in the tomb and a rock was rolled in the place to seal it shut. Perhaps the first open acknowledgement of who Jesus was came from an unlikely source late on Friday. The centurion in charge of the crucifixion guards was there to ensure the death of this condemned man, Jesus. It was the centurion's job to make sure the death of Jesus was painful and humiliating. When Jesus died on the cross on Friday afternoon, the sky became like night and an earthquake shook Jerusalem. And as the centurion and the guards stood before the dead body of Jesus, they had a sudden realisation. And we read in Matthew 27, the Roman officer and the other soldiers at the crucifixion were terrified by the earthquake and all that had happened. And they said, this man truly was the son of God. The sad thing is, we never hear anything more about these soldiers. We don't read about them in the upper room with the other followers of Jesus a few days later, or even in the crowd of believers on the day of Pentecost. They never appear in the narrative again. But at that point on Friday afternoon, if you had asked the soldiers at the base of the cross, who is this man? They would have replied, he is the son of God. And what of the others who saw Jesus die on the cross on that Friday afternoon? All four gospel accounts record the fact that Joseph of Arimathea went to Mount Pontius Pilate and asked to be given the body of Jesus to prepare it for burial before the Sabbath. Afterwards, Joseph of Arimathea, who'd been a secret disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jewish leaders, boldly asked Pilate for permission to take Jesus' body down, and Pilate told him to go ahead. So he came and took it away. Nicodemus, the man who had come to Jesus at night, came too, bringing about 45 kilograms of embalming ointment made from myrrh and aloes. Together they wrapped Jesus' body in a long linen cloth saturated with the spices, as is the Jewish custom of burial. The place of crucifixion was near a grove of trees where there was a new tomb never used before. And so because of the need for haste before the Sabbath and because the tomb was close at hand, they laid him there. Historical records show that the more respected an individual was in their society, the larger the quantity of costly embalming spices and oils for burial preparation. For example, the Jewish historian Josephus records that 18 kilograms of spices were used at the funeral of the highly respected elder Gamaliel. And you might recall that Gamaliel was the teacher of Saul in Jerusalem before the Apostle Paul had that experience of meeting Jesus on the Damascus Road. On this occasion, Nicodemus bought twice that amount of spices and oils to use on Jesus' body. Then when the body was in the tomb, they left to prepare for the Sabbath. What did Joseph and Nicodemus and the disciples and Mary and Mary the mother of Jesus, Lazarus and his sisters Mary and Martha and all the other followers, 
What did they all do for the next 36 hours before Sunday? We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. But we do know what happened early Sunday morning. In Mark chapter 16 and in the passage in Luke 24, we know a group of women, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome, came to the tomb with spices. Why? Did they feel it was necessary to apply more spices and ointment to the body? Or was this an additional act of honour to show their respect for Jesus? Can you imagine the sadness they felt as they walked in that early dawn light to that tomb? That feeling of hollow grief, the feeling of abandonment, that stone in your stomach type of grief, those bewildered and confused thoughts, trudging on, probably quite glad that they had something to do to cope with the immense feelings of grief. They don't know, though, how they will move the stone away at the entrance of the tomb. But as they approach the tomb, the stone has been moved. They creep into the tomb, and it's empty. And if that isn't shock in itself, two men are there, glowing like lightning, and they say, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Luke, in his account of this scene, is very straightforward and factual. Maybe that was his training as a physician doctor. But Mark's gospel goes on to say, trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. In John's gospel, in chapter 20, it tells us that Mary stood there crying. She sees two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken away my Lord, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realise that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Jesus knew her by name, and she knew his voice. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told them what he had said this, these things to her. The first person who sees Jesus is Mary Magdalene, the woman who has had seven demons cast out of her by Jesus. It's become an urban myth that Mary was a prostitute, but there's no evidence of this. The Bible does tell us, though, that Mary Magdalene and Susanna, 
and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, who was King Herod's business manager, have been contributing their resources to support Jesus and his disciples during his ministry. And if you had asked Mary, who is this man? I'm sure she would have responded, he's the one who changed my life. He's the one who set me free from my demons. The miracle of grace is a changed life. That when we ask Christ to forgive us, he does forgive us. Over and over again, the Bible describes that experience as a new beginning, new life, being born again, to become a new creation. And at that point, we are given the opportunity of a brand new life. The Bible tells us to repent, to turn away from our old life, to turn to God. That's the start of a new life. Throughout the Gospels, there are accounts of people delivered from their demons, people who were healed and restored. They each had an encounter with Christ, as did Mary on that day, which changed her life. But for Mary, that was just the beginning of a life committed to following the Jesus who had set her free. The same Jesus who offered Mary a new life offers us a new life. But news of the resurrection wasn't just for Mary. In Mark's account, we read the angelic messenger said to Mary, go and tell his disciples, including Peter. I don't know if the apostles decided, the disciples decided that Peter no longer deserved to be part of their group, or if that was a decision that Peter made himself. But the messenger wanted to be very clear that Peter was to be included in the news of the resurrection. Peter? Really? Peter? Peter, who had been the first to follow Jesus. Peter, who was the first to acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah. Peter, who was the one who offered to die for Jesus and then followed that up by cutting off the ear of a soldier in the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane last Thursday night when the guards came to arrest Jesus. Peter, who just two days ago denied Christ publicly on three occasions. When push came to shove, Peter denied Jesus and he blew it. He knew what he had done and as Jesus is condemned to die and taken from Pontius Pilate's palace, Pilate leaves a bro Peter leaves a broken man and we are not told where he went. Have you ever noticed that when the Bible writers describe Jesus dying on the cross, Peter is not named as one of those standing near the cross. He is not mentioned when the body is taken down and prepared for the tomb. Was he too humiliated by his failure? But on the first day of the week, we read that Peter was with the other disciples. And the news that Mary Magdalene tells them is for them all, including Peter. Isn't it extraordinary that Peter, who most vehemently denied Jesus, is given a second chance? Like Peter, you might think that God has written you off and that he could never forgive you for something in your life. But that's not the case. The same Jesus who offered Peter a second chance offers it to us. On that Sunday, if you had asked Peter, who is this man? He would have told you, he's the one who's given me a second chance. Later, Jesus appears to Peter and the other disciples in the upper, upper room. 
but Thomas, nicknamed the twin, wasn't there. John chapter 24 tells us that when they tell Thomas, we have seen the Lord, he replies, I won't believe it unless I see that nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. Thomas just doesn't believe them. Let's face it, his life has been turned upside down. Only a week ago, he had watched his teacher riding into Jerusalem on a donkey on a wave of adulation. Jesus, the one who would bring Israel back to its former glory and maybe get rid of all of these Roman armies. Then four days later, on that Thursday night, Thomas watched as Jesus was arrested, tried and crucified. He had just gotten his head around the fact that Jesus was dead. And now on the third day, everybody was saying that Jesus wasn't dead. He was alive and they'd seen him. Thomas was a pragmatist. I need to see him for myself, he says. John chapter 20 tells us that eight days after the resurrection Sunday, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer, believe. Thomas exclaimed, my Lord and my God. Eight days later, wow, for eight days, the other disciples bubbled with excitement while Thomas had simmered in doubt. But when Jesus turned up, he didn't condemn Thomas for his feelings. He didn't criticize him for not believing. Instead, he said, you needed to see, to believe? Well, here I am. Have you ever had times of doubt in your Christian life? If Jesus is really God, then why has he allowed dot, 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 this situation to occur? You can fill in the blanks. Why is my child sick? How come I've lost my job? Why did my spouse die? Why do I keep doing the things I know are wrong? And then we feel guilty about having doubts. I think if you'd ask Thomas, who is this man? He would have replied, he's the one who understood my doubts. There's a lesson there for all of us this Easter Sunday. It's all right to have doubts. It's human. I'm sure that Thomas wondered why he was kept waiting when the other ten saw Jesus on Resurrection Sunday. But God doesn't always work to our timetable. Because of Thomas, we know we aren't the first to doubt. And because of Jesus' response, we know that we won't be condemned for our doubt if it leads us to believe. As a result of the resurrection, we can answer the question, who is this man? And our response should be, he is the one who changed my life, who gave me a second chance and who understands my doubts. Here is the promise for you and me today. John chapter 20 says, You believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. So here we are. Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, 2021. Before the resurrection, and before his crucifixion, Jesus asked Peter and the other disciples, 
Who do people say I am? And their response is found in Mark chapter 8. Well, I replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say you are one of his prophets. Now listen to Jesus' response. But who do you say I am? And Peter replied, you are the Messiah. You see, it doesn't matter what or who others say Jesus was or is. All that matters today for you and me is who do you say Jesus is? Who is Jesus in your life? He can change your life and mine. He can offer a second chance and he can answer our doubts but only if you and I ask him. If you were asked that question today, what would be your response? For a lot of people, Easter is just another three day holiday long weekend of fun and no work. It's chocolate bunnies and Easter eggs and hot cross buns. But we know better. For Christians, Easter means the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. It means hope of a better life. It means joy. And I don't mean fleeting happiness, but profound and deep joy. It means the promise of life after death. The resurrection of Jesus is the basis of our faith and the basis of truth. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then we're just wasting our time here Sunday after Sunday. And let me stress, if you leave this service this morning, if you finish watching this service at home, if you leave this building stressed, guilty for having doubts, never feeling that you're quite the Christian you should be, you've missed the point. The saving work of God is done. It is finished. The angel says to you and to me, he is not here, he is risen. Do you ever wonder why was the stone rolled away from the tomb? Well, the stone was not rolled away to let Jesus walk out. The stone was rolled away so that we could look in. It was rolled away so that the empty tomb could be visible to all. The empty tomb is the greatest evidence of the resurrection of Jesus. The empty tomb stands as evidence to everyone that Jesus is not dead. He is alive today. Easter means victory. God's victory over death, hell and the grave. This is your promise today. This Easter day, through Jesus, there is new life for all who believe. The darkness of Friday is gone. Today is a brand new day. And while we remain seated, we're going to play, it's the Leonard Cohen song, Hallelujah, but it's using Easter words. And I pray that this might be a time of prayerful reflection and an opportunity for you to be thankful. A crown of thorns placed on his head, he knew that he would soon be dead. He said, Nailed him. 
hung his head and prepared to die, then lifted his face up to the sky, said, I am coming home now, Father, to you. A reed which had his final sip was just. Say this uh, prayer of thanksgiving for the offerings that have been made online this week or those of you that might have your offertory envelopes to put into the bowl at the door. Let's say this prayer together. <coughs> Loving God, we thank you this Easter day with its promise of new life and new opportunities. 
Use us and our gifts to love and to serve you and to witness to Christ, whom you have raised. Amen. And the announcements today. There is a copy of the Benora Pointer waiting for you at the door, so uh, please do pick one of those up as you um, leave the building. During April, uh, Uniting World is promoting seven days of solidarity and invites us as individuals and as a congregation to celebrate the risen Jesus and to get to know more about how God is changing the lives of people throughout the world through Uniting World Partnerships. Today and next Sunday, the 11th of April, we'll learn a little bit more about this work and it's covered in this short video. All over the globe, we see joy, struggle, determination. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Join us for Uniting World's Seven Days of Solidarity. Our people, our stories, our God at work. Come with us on a celebration of our global neighbours. God's work is hope, healing, and transformation, and it happens through us. From Sunday the 18th to Saturday the 24th of April, we're encouraged to be active. We can, if you want to get a printed copy of this booklet, or you can have these stories downloaded each day to your um, email inbox in a digital format. And each day we'll receive a story of the work of Jesus at work in different parts of the world. We'll be asked to pray for the work in that area and to take action in solidarity. These daily stories will be available in that printed booklet and I've got at least 50 copies available for members here at Benora Point or there is um, in the newsletter this week, explains how you can download the digital format. On Sunday the 25th of April, we will celebrate God's faithfulness and recommit ourselves to God's global mission. If you would like a copy of this a booklet to use each day during the seven days of solidarity, there is a list in the foyer. So on your way out today, if you could just leave me your name, so that we know if we've got enough and need to order more. There is more information in the Benora Pointer and also how you can download the digital version. We come now to it in our service to the time of communion. I know that there are visitors here today and I welcome you here to celebrate Easter Sunday with us. If your faith and trust is in Jesus Christ, you are most welcome to share in this Last Supper meal, the Holy Communion of Jesus. Because of COVID, we can't serve communion as such. So if you have not already done so, there are some wafers and some grape juice available on the side table if you would just take the next few minutes to get organised. Peace of the Lord be always with you. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Hear the words of the institution of the sacrament as recorded by the Apostle Paul. Anybody else who's got their phone on, would you please turn it off? This is what the Apostle Paul said. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, 
that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this for the remembrance of me in the same way also the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it for the remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes and so according to our Savior's command we set this bread and this cup apart for the Holy Supper to which he calls us and we come to God with our prayers of thanksgiving. Lift up your hearts. It is right to give thanks to our Lord and God. Thanks and praise, glory and honour are rightly yours, our Lord and God, for you alone are worthy. In time beyond our dreaming, you brought forth life out of darkness. And in the love of Christ, your Son, you set man and woman at the heart of your creation. And so we praise you with the faithful of every time and place, joining with choirs of angels and the whole creation in this eternal hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We thank you that you called a covenant people to be a light to the nations. Through Moses you taught us to love your law, and in the prophets you cried out for justice. In the fullness of your mercy you became one with us in Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for us on the cross. You make us alive together with him, that we may rejoice in his presence and share his peace. By water and the Spirit, you open the kingdom to all who believe and welcome us to your table. For by grace we are saved through faith. With this bread and this cup, we do as our Saviour commands. We celebrate the redemption he has won for us. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out the Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and wine that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ. Make us one with him, one with each other, and one in ministry in the world until at least last we feast with him in the kingdom. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, in your holy church, all honour and glory are yours, Father Almighty, now and forever. Amen. Blessing and honour and glory and power are yours forever and ever. Amen. And as Jesus taught us, we are confident to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The bread we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup we take is a sharing in the blood of Christ. The gifts of God for the people of God. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, Redeemer of the world, grant us peace. Receive this holy sacrament of the body and blood of Christ and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Would you please take the sacrament that you have, the wafer, 
the body of Christ given for you. Amen. take the cup. The blood of Christ given for you. Amen. Let's say this prayer together. We thank you, Lord. So next slide, Les. Together we thank you, Lord, that you have fed us in this sacrament, united us with Christ, and given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet prepared for all people. Amen. point we should have been up on our feet and about to sing the great hymn thine be the glory risen conquering son instead we'll stay seated and we'll use the words as part of our celebration
God, the creator of the life, Jesus Christ, the source of eternal life, and the Holy Spirit, the power in each and every life, bless you this day and every day. Thanks and, sorry, wrong sheet. Go in peace to love the living Lord on this Easter Sunday. We go in the power of Christ's resurrection. Alleluia. I hope you will indulge me because the last two pieces of music are my favourite pieces of music for Easter. Some of you may remember in the 1980s there was a group called the Second Chapter of Acts. Brothers and sisters, Annie Herring, the one in the middle, Katie Neeson, uh, uh, Kelly Neeson on the left, and Matthew Ward on the right. The two photos here show how they've aged. Well, Matthew Ward, uh, he will be singing the song that his sister wrote, Annie Herring wrote, called the Easter Song. And even as he's got older, the song has not lost its meaning. I'll have to stand for this one.
Believe it or not, that's actually in the Uniting Together in Song hymn book, so it's become conventional. You might like to remain standing for this last piece of music. It's believed that in the uh, 1743, when Handel premiered the uh, Messiah, King George II was there. And we don't know whether it was his arthritis or whether he actually was so moved by the music, but that when he heard the song, the music, the orchestration to the Messiah, he stood to his feet. And to this day, it's been a tradition that wherever audiences are anywhere in the world, when the Messiah is heard, if you are able, please stand. I wish you a blessed and happy, peaceful Easter and most unusual Easter, but nevertheless, one in which we're all safe and healthy. And I just pray that this day might dwell in your minds as you are encouraged to know Jesus rose from the dead for you and for me. Happy Easter.